Hi everyone, I'm Mitesh Navratinam from the group K of Ordo. My group members are me, myself, Muhammad Yase, Muhammad Hussam Saifi, and lastly, Zakir. So now we come to our group's question. The question that has been given to my group is, numerous cases have been decided by the courts in relating to safeguards for public servants in Malaysia, examine the principles as established by the constitution and applied and expanded by the courts on the safeguards. So, now we move on to the first part, which is the introduction. <coughs> so, before we move on to the crucial parts of the question, we need to first know the definition of the public services. What are public services? As defined in Article 132 until Article 148 in Part 10 of the Federal Constitution, Public services are the armed forces, the judicial and legal services, the general public service of the federation, the police force, the joint public services mentioned in one, Article 133, the public service of each state and lastly the education service. So now we move on to what is the definition of a public servant. So a public servant is any member of the public services I've mentioned above. <laughs> okay, so um the commission that governs public services in Malaysia is the Public Services Commission. It is done so by virtue of Article 144 Clause 1 of the Federal Constitution, which stipulates that subject to the provisions of any existing law and to the provisions of this Constitution, it shall be the duty of a commission to which this part applies to appoint, confirm and place on the permanent or pensionable establishment promote, transfer and exercise disciplinary control over members of the service to which its jurisdiction extends. This Public Services Commission was found on 31st of August 1977, which is also our Independence Day. So the six main functions as extracted from uh, the, uh, the article is appointment, confirmation of service, confirmation into pension status, promotion, transfer and lastly exercising disciplinary control. Okay, now we move on to the principles that govern public services, which is the principles of doctrine of pleasure. <clears throat> so, the doctrine of pleasure is the doctrine that originates under English law. It is mostly a moral and unwritten rule that states that a public servant of the crown holds office only under the pleasure of the crown. So, the Latin maxim that rules this doctrine is durante bene placito requis or the during good pleasure of the king. In Malaysia, a public servant is directly responsible to the king, who is Yang Dipanton Agum, and holds his office only under the pleasure of the king. So, uh, as we uh, as we saw before in Article 223, Clause 2A, uh, every member, every person who is a member of the public service of a state who holds office during the pleasure of the ruler or the Yang Dipanton Negeri. Uh, we can see. Uh, we can refer to the doctrine of pleasure by using the case of Government of Malaysia versus Mahan Singh, 1975, in which the respondent, who is an officer in the Special Commissioners of Income Tax Office, was suddenly terminated uh, by the Director of Operations under Regulation 44 of the General Orders Cap D. So the respondent, uh, who was officer, brought an action against the government to declare that the termination of his service by the, uh, by the Director has been white. So, in the Court of Appeal, it was held that, number one, the, a pensionable officer has no right lien or title to his post and all federal public officers hold office at the pleasure of the young Dipertuan Ago. Second, Regulation 44 of General Orders Cap D is not inconsistent with the federal constitution and is therefore valid. And the third one, the government had the power to terminate the respondent service in the public interest under the regulation and as government's decision to do so did not involve punishing or pen penalizing the respondent, he had not been dismissed and therefore was not entitled to a reasonable opportunity of being heard under Article 135 Clause 2 of the Federal Constitution. Now we move on to this certain, uh, certain service conditions for a public servant. So there are three uh, main service conditions. The first, first one is no security of tenure. All public servants hold office during the pleasure of the YDPA or ruler or governor as mentioned in Article 132 Clause 2A. Uh, so the Crown's right to terminate of the services of its empl employees is implied in any contract of employment. Implied. Okay, so in the case of Mahan Singh, the judge ruled that in Malaysia there is no such right against the government to continuity of employment, promotion or pension. 
The second one is the terms of services of a public servant is alterable. The terms of services of a public servant may be altered without his consent. So the rules prevailing at the time of appointment may be changed. As decided in the case of John Haji Sulaiman versus Government of Plantan, the court held that the government can unilaterally impose post-entry requirements on its employees. The third one is there is no absolute right of pension for a public servant. There is no absolute right to pension, gratuity or other allowances. The YDPA may reduce or withhold pensions, but only if he is satisfied that the public servant is guilty of negligence, irregularity or misconduct by virtue of the Pensions Act 1980. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. My name is Zaki Hafizin bin Zakaria, metric number 2114637 and I will be explaining on substantive safeguards for public servants as well as Procedural safeguards under Article 135, Clause 1. Public servants enjoy many rights and privileges under various Acts of Parliament and quasi-legislative service regulations and circulars. In addition, the Constitution confers some substantive safeguards on them. The substantive safeguards include impartial treatment, pensions, recovery of areas, tortious claims, and proportionality in punishment. Firstly, impartial treatment. According to Article 136, everyone working for the Federation in the same grade and regardless of race must be fairly treated. Article 136 must be interpreted in conjunction with Article 153, which allows for reservations and quotas in favour of Malays and residents of Sabah and Sarawak, which raises complex concerns. However, the late Tun Sofian believed that when Article 136 and 153 are combined, the impact is that ethnicity may be taken into account at the moment of entry. Nevertheless, while in service, promotions, awards, etc. must be based on merit. Secondly, pensions. Pensions, gratuities and other similar benefits are protected under Article 147 for public servants, their widows, children, dependents or personal representatives. Several legislation, including the Pensions Act 1980, includes the specific pension regulations. Thirdly, recovery of areas. Despite his vulnerable position, a civil servant has the right to bring a lawsuit against the Crown to recover unpaid wages or for any other breach of contract law. Fourth, tortious claims. If the Crown or a public authority caused a civil servant to suffer a loss, he or she may file a tort claim against the government for damages. A public employee may file a civil lawsuit for intentional lying against the officer, not the government, if he has evidence of malice or ill faith on the part of his superior. Lastly, proportionality in punishment. In all legitimate expectation situations, the decision maker must observe a duty to act fairly. This obligation has evolved through time to include both a substantive and a procedural component. Fair processes must produce fair outcomes. Going through the motions of fair procedures is insufficient. Fair, responsible and proportionate outcomes are required. When determining what punishment to impose on a specific employee, a disciplinary authority must act rationally and fairly. Its decision could be overturned or set aside if it is made arbitrarily or unfairly and imposes a penalty that is excessive in comparison to the offence. A case that shows public servants being safeguarded substantively is the case of Ng Hok Cheng and Pangara A.M. Penjara. The Federal Court reserved A case that shows public servants being safeguarded substantively is the case of Ng Hok Cheng and Pangara A.M. Penjara. The Federal Court reserved the Court of Appeals decision in Tan Tek Seng and upheld the proportionality principle in Ng Hok Cheng and Pangara A.M. Penjara typing and others. Due to significant debts, the disciplinary authorities dismissed the appellant. He contended that the initial sentence was overly harsh before the High Court, Court of Appeal and Federal Court. The disciplinary tribunal is the best judge of an employee's wrongdoing according to all three courts. Though public servants have no substantive right to their post, they do have some procedural protections under Article 135, Clauses 1, 2 and 3 and under Common Law Natural Justice Principles. No member of the public services, with the exception of a member of the armed forces, may be discharged or demoted by a body below the one that had the appointment authority according to Article 135, Clause 1. A case that I would like to highlight briefly showing the applicability of Article 135, Clause 1 is the case of Surinder Singh Kanda and Government of Malaya. The plaintiff, an inspector in the Royal Federation of Malaya Police Force was first given a probationary appointment in 1951 and was then given a permanent appointment to the rank of inspector on 1st June 1953. He was then fired by the police commissioner on July 7, 1958. It was decided that Article 144 Clause 1 of the Constitution should be read in conjunction with Article 135 Clause 1 of the Constitution at the relevant time. It was also decided that the Police Service Commission had the authority to appoint and consequently dismiss officers of his rank and that the Commission of Police did not since he was a body subordinate to the Police Service Commission. However, 
there are many exceptions to the Article 135 Clause 1 safeguard. Firstly, Article 135 Clause 1 is not applicable to situations where the dismissing authority to subordinate in rank to the appointing authority was acting in pursuance of a power delegated to it by a commissioner. In states other than Penang and Malacca, members of the public service of each state may be removed by a board appointed by the ruler if state law has delegated the power of the State Public Service Commission to the board. Third, the safeguard of Article 135 Clause 1 does not apply to members of the armed forces. Lastly, the safeguard of Article 135 Clause 1 does not apply if the removal from office does not amount to dismissal or reduction in rank but falls within the concept of termination. My name is Muhammad Hussain Safi bin Mahadi. My metro number is 115 and I will talk about procedural safeguard under Article 135 Clause 2. First and foremost, Article 135 Clause 2 constitutionalizes the natural justice rule of prior hearing. No public servant may be dismissed or reduced in rank without being given a reasonable opportunity of being heard. In regards to the meaning of dismiss, firstly, removal from office is not necessarily a dismissal. As according to the case of government and Mahan Singh, on appeal to the Privy Council, the Federal Court was reversed and Lord Diplock laid down that any removal by whatever name called will amount to dismissal if it is connected with the conduct of the appellant in relation to his office which was regarded by the government as unsatisfactory or blameworthy and if the consequences of the termination involve an element of punishment. The Privy Council found that both prerequisites were met. Mahan Singh was dismissed, not merely terminated. As no prior hearing was given, there was a breach of Article 135 Clause 2 and his dismissal was declared null and void. That's to the meaning of the reduction in rank. A reversion to the following post does not amount to reduction in rank, provided the public servant was not already confirmed in his new post, as the case in Monosami and Public Service Commission. Now, it was held in this case that there has been no reduction of rank, enabling the appellant to reply on the provision of Article 135 Clause 2 and obtain a hearing for the reason that the action of the respondent could not be characterized as being by way of punishment. Right? It is not a reduction in rank to transfer a schoolmaster from school to another if he continues to be employed in the same category as previously and his remuneration remains the same and even though he loses his supervisory duties. As in the case of Pengarah, Pelajaran and Lut Tinggi, it was held that no officer can claim to have a legal right of non-transferability -transferab because by joining the government service, he has become liable to transfer. There was nothing to show that the respondent had been reduced in rank by the transfer. Taking him away from a supervisory capacity is not a reduction in rank within the meaning of the Article 135 of the Federal Constitution. And in regards to the meaning of reasonable opportunity of being heard, a wide variety of case law on the subject has clarified the component of this constitutionalized natural justice rule. Firstly, the officer concerned should have a full opportunity of stating his case before he is dismissed and the right to be heard does not imply the right to be heard orally. Hearing can be oral or by way of written representation. As in the case of Najah Singh and government, the court said that the words heard does not invariably connotes an oral hearing. It can be used and is not infrequently used in relation to something written. Its meaning must depend on the context in which it is used and in the context in which uh, used in this case cannot have been intended only to mean on oral hearing. Thirdly, the accused should be supplied with all information and documents made known to the adjudicator. The deciding authority must not receive evidence behind the back of the accused without giving him an opportunity to rebut such evidence, such in the case of Surinder, Singh, Kanda and government that had been explained by Zakir before this. Fourthly, the appeal authority should not enhance the punishment without providing a hearing, as in the case of Attorney General Singapore and Ling Ho Dung. The employee appealed against a fine and reprimand by the appellate authority dismissed the employee. The court held that the employee had a right to know his dismissal was under consideration and therefore a right to be heard on the question of his dismissal. However, it must be noted that though a hearing need not be oral, the courts have in some cases sounded a caution that the measure of fairness given to the plaintiff is a question of fact and degree in some circumstances a fair hearing must permit oral representation as in the case of Raja Abdul Malik Muzaffar Shah and Setia Suharan Jaya Pasukan Polis. Uh, as in this case, the plaintiff submit that the defendant were under duty to act fairly which include the obligation to give him an oral hearing. 
The failure to do this had deprived the plaintiff of his right to be heard, which is enshrined in Article 135 Clause 2 of the Federal Constitution. And it was held that the court allowed the plaintiff's appeal and ordered his reinstatement. But not least, unlike criminal cases where there is always a plea in mitigation before sentencing, in disciplinary cases there is no need to give a separate hearing on what punishment to be imposed, provided that uh, the launching of the proceeding the accused was alerted that dismissal or reduction in rank was contemplated. As in the case of Lembaga Tata Tertib Perkhidmatan Awam Hospital Besar Pulau Pinang and Utra Badi, in this case the court said that there is no requirement of a separate hearing on the question of punishment. My name is Muhammad Yasir bin Saadun. I will be present uh, metric number 2118163. I will be presenting on the exceptions to Article 135 Clause 2. There are many exceptions to the right to be heard. Firstly, the armed forces and in the situation when there is no need to give a hearing prior to dismissal or reduction in rank in four situations. The safeguard of Article 135 Clause 2 does not apply to members of the Armed Forces by virtue of Section 9 of the Armed Forces Act 1972, Armed Forces Court Martial Rules of Procedure 1976. The Constitution provision highlighted in Article 132 Clause 1, 135 Clause 1, and 135 Clause 2, all members of Armed Forces are excluded from the safeguard and protection of all the altering pattern. There is no person shall be condemned unheard. Courts have declined in matters in reviewing military proceedings. It is evident in the case of Abdul Salam bin Hussein, it was held that the court has no jurisdiction to inquire into the circumstances under which the member of the armed forces ceased to hold office. But in the case of Peter Chong and On versus Colonel Adam Abu Bakar, the court refers to interfere in proceedings before military courts. Firstly, other than excluded principle of all the autumn bottom, all other constitutional and common law rights should apply. The natural justice rule against bias should apply. Secondly, under Section 9 of the Armed Forces Act 1972, the YDPA may, on the recommendation of Armed Forces Council, at any time without assigning any reason, therefore cancel any commission granted under the provision of this part. This implies that the ultimate decision by the YDPA to dismiss an armed force personnel is exempted from the duty to give a prior hearing. The duty to hear should also be imposed on the recommending authority before it makes representations to the YDPA. That leads to giving of reasons that the YDPA is not required to give any reason to the dismissed officer. However, this does not mean the government should be exempt from supplying reasons to court. Lastly, it is arguable that Section 9 of the Armed Forces Act 1972 is ultra biased to Article 135 Clause 2 because it goes beyond the exemption granted by Article 135 Clause 2. It excludes prior hearing but does not authorize a dismissal without assigning any reasons therefore. The nature of the nature and content of natural justice is converting. Formerly, natural justice was viewed as a common law safeguard of a purely procedural nature. The right to natural justice is derived from Article 5's forms of due process and Article 8's requirement of equal protection. Natural justice is not solely about fair procedure but also requires just result. Moving on to the next exception, under provisions to Article 135 Clause 2, there is no need to give a hearing prior to dismissal or reduction in rank in four situations. Firstly, where a criminal charge has been proved against a member of service. In Tan Tech Seng was a Surujan Jaya Perkhidmatan Pendidikan, it was highlighted that since the word used in Article 13502A is proved and not convicted, there must be first a plea of finding of guilt. Only then the protection of Article 13502 be deemed to be statutory withdrawn. It must also be noted that conviction in court does not automatically justify dismissal of the public servant. Secondly, hearing not reasonably practicable, where the authority empowered to dismiss or reduce in rank is satisfied, that for some reason to be recorded in writing, a hearing is not reasonably practicable. It is tenable that as reasons have to be reduced to writing, they should be amendable to judicial review. Thirdly, security conditions where YDPA state rule or the young department agree is satisfied that a hearing will not be in the interest of the security of the federation. 
Referring to the authority in CCSU versus Minister of Civil Service, courts can insist that the executive should offer some proof that consideration of security are indeed at risk. Lastly, public servant under detention. When order of detention, supervision, banishment, deportation, or restricted residence has been imposed upon the public servant, where in the case of Mahan Singh, these exceptions, the rights to be heard is on a convergence point. Where there is some other action or other dismissal or reduction, the safeguards of Article 135, Clause 1 and Clause 2 apply to situations where the public servant is dismissed or reduced in rank. In reality, there are 15 or so other ways in which the government can deal with errant civil servants. Firstly, under in interdiction, the exclusion from office of not less than half a public servant's emoluments, under regulation 4 of the Public Officer's Conduct and Discipline Regulations 1993, if the officer is facing criminal or disciplinary proceedings, with a view to dismissal or reduction in rank, interdiction under Regulation 45 for a period of not exceeding one month in order to facilitate the investigation. Secondly, suspension, the exclusion from office or no pay under Regulation 32, Subregion 5, 36, 1, Subregion 1, and 46, Subregion 1 of 1993, suspension is permitted where the officer is convicted by any criminal court or when or order of detention or restriction is imposed on the officers. Termination under contract, termination of the service or temporary or probationary or contract officer can be done by giving contractual notice or salary in lieu of notice. This is held in the case of Abdul of Ali versus Rohanjai Pasukan Police. Moving on to termination in public interest, this leads to premature retirement under Regulation 33C, 36 Subregulation 2C, and 49 Subregulation 1 of the Public Officers' Conduct and Discipline Regulations 1993. The safeguard of Article 135 are not applicable as decided in the case of Raja Singhan versus S. Rasia versus the government, but are, but are Regular 49. Section 1 gives to the authority a discussion whether to give a prior hearing or not. Reversion to former post. If an officer is not confirmed in a substantive post or is merely in acting capacity or is on short term appointment to a temporary post or if it is discovered that he is not qualified for the post in which he was acting, then it does not amount to reduction in rank to reinstate him back to his former post before and after the expiry of his term. Moving on to lateral or horizontal transfer, in the case of Lut Tingyi, the learned judge held that if an officer can be dismissed at pleasure, he can be asked to serve anywhere at pleasure. Anywhere in this case cannot mean anywhere outside the country or anywhere outside the government service. Detention, supervision, banishment under Regulation 36 and 37, if an officer is subject to an order of detention, supervision, residence, banishment, or deportation, he is conclusively suspended. The requirement of prior hearing is excluded. Moving on to institutional of course, criminal proceeding, the government may report an officer to PDRM or the MSCC without alerting him. No disciplinary action can be taken pending of criminal proceedings. On compulsory retirement, an officer may be compulsory and prematurely retired on a number of grounds provided in the Pension Act 1980 due to several reasons such as medical reason. Moving on to surcharge, under the Financial Procedure Act 1957 and Regulation 51, any public officer who is in charge of public funds and is adjudged to be guilty of financial responsibility is liable to be surcharged with a view to compensating the government loss. Lastly, reduction of salary, deferment of salary movement, and forfeiture of amendments, fine, and warning. That will be all for me. Thank you.